Well, good Sabbath to you all, and yeah, we'll bless you. It's sort of an unusual Sabbath once again when you see empty seats out there, but uh, I know you're at your homes, I hope, during this time. And as I promised, I had mentioned that we're going to uh, give some sort of an update for the Passover memorial, how we're going to do it, and uh, the time and that sort of thing. So uh, before I do that, I just want to give a little context to where we're at right now. January 21st was the first confirmed case of the coronavirus here in the United States. Last week, the numbers were 104,000. This week, this morning, the numbers are just under 300,000. That's almost a tripling in one week. We tend to forget the context because we get bombarded with these numbers from hour to hour, it seems, on the news. But honestly, this is moving and spreading quickly. Uh, there are so many different aspects of this that we need to consider, and that's what we're going to try to do today in the context of uh, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which are just a few days away at this point. So what we're planning to do with the Feast of Unleavened Bread and uh, the Passover Memorial is we're going to do a live stream of the Passover Memorial from here. Uh, we're inviting everybody that would like to participate to do so. Make sure you have the emblems on hand at home. If you use wine or if you use grape juice, make sure you have some in, in store. And also unleavened bread. If you don't have the store-bought cardboard type, you can always make your own. All you need is water, a little bit of salt, and uh, some flour. You don't need any leavening, so it's easy to make, and it doesn't matter how brittle it is. It won't be as hard and tough as the stuff you buy. So give that a shot, and um, be prepared for the partaking of the emblems. We're going to start the broadcast probably around 7.30 or a few minutes after. Sundown is 7.43, I believe, here in Pennsylvania. So uh, we're going to be starting... In that context, probably won't really get rolling with the Passover service until about quarter till or, or ten till um, eight o'clock. So we'd like you to, to come. We're going to have an unusual service because we'll all be participating as the body of the Messiah, but we're going to be in our respective homes. It's actually going to be pretty much like the Exodus Passover. It, it's really just the thought of it. As I, as I was making some preparations for the message today is, you know, in, in the time of Israel coming out of Egypt, the people that were in Egypt were all in their homes on that first Passover. And while they were separated by the physical boundaries of their walls, they were still all united doing the same thing within those walls. And that's kind of how this Passover is going to be for us. So um, we need to Keep in mind that Yahweh is still king. He is sovereign. And uh, to me, it brings a tremendous amount of security and joy to realize that we have the, the relationship with Yahweh and with Yahshua that we do, and that they do care for us as the scripture is so clear in describing for each one of us. So before we get started, um, well, I should mention also that the the broadcast of the um, Passover memorial is going to be just like this is. It's going to be on Mixlr and Facebook. If you're in a time zone and there are several people that want to participate with us that are in a different time zone, they can do so by going back and reaching the archives and um, listening to the service and participating as we go through. And another thing I'd like to remind everybody is that you prepare yourself spiritually for the Passover memorial this year as we do every year. Examine yourself, like the scripture says, to see whether you're in the faith and that you are taking the emblems in a worthy manner. We are blessed this year that we have a little extra time to be doing that. We're not all rushed right up to the last second like we normally are, and then we sort of fall into the Passover memorial and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This year it's a little bit different because we have a little bit more time on our hands. So take advantage of it to prepare yourself. <clears throat> All right, well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads at this time. We'll pray. We'll approach Yahweh's throne of grace and um, 
ask his blessing upon the service today. Almighty Heavenly Father Yahweh, we thank you once again for the opportunity to approach your throne. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son and our Savior, Yahshua the Messiah, and how, as we look to him, we realize that it is through his sacrifice that we can approach your throne with boldness. Even though we have our human frailties, Father, you aren't holding those things against us because Yahshua has taken away that curse. And so we ask that you would bless us in an even greater fashion. We pray that you will increase our understanding, our wisdom, so we can truly represent you on this earth, so your will be done on this earth as it is in the heavens. Father, we are so thankful for the way things are developing at this time, not the, the death and the sickness, but Father, the realization that many people are starting to take seriously their lives and why they are here. They are asking the questions, Father, that you can answer through the pages of your word. And we just ask that all things that are done will be done according to your will. We pray you will bless each one that hears or sees this message. We ask that as we do so, that we may take to heart your word, because it is your word that gives us life and sustains us. So, Father, we thank you for all your blessings, and especially we thank you for this Sabbath day. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Yahshua, hallelujah and amen. What I'd like to do is, and I'm not sure how long this is going to be. I have to be honest with you. This could be a message that is right in the ballpark of what we normally have, which is 50 minutes to an hour, or this can go a little longer because of what we're going to be discussing it's in the context of, of the time that we're in right now that I want to develop this message because we are living in a troubled and tumultuous time. None of us anticipates or looks forward to trouble or trial. But when you're in the midst of it, you just sort of roll through with it. You deal with the circumstances as they develop. Why is all this taking place? Why is it at the beginning of the year? Last week we looked a little bit as to how the worldwide calamities that the scripture records took place at this specific time of year, at the beginning of the year. And I think Yahweh in his wisdom and his compassion allows that to take place for a very specific reason. And that is because of the beginning of the year, you have the newness of life, the restoration of life coming onto this earth through the spring cycle. And you also have a good climate to where you can have minimal impact. If it was the middle of winter, that would be a whole different story for us. So we have to, even in the midst of a trial or trouble, we need to understand that Yahweh does still care for us. And he's trying to make it as bearable for us as we can so that we can walk it through. Why does Yahweh allow troublesome time to come? I'd like to go back. I'm going to start in a little bit of an unusual spot when you think of the virus, this disease that's out there right now sweeping throughout the earth. I want to start in an unusual place, but I believe it's a place that will give us a good reference point to what Yahweh is really doing and where he's headed with all this, and also simultaneously to be preparing us for the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is coming on... Tuesday evening will be the Passover memorial, so that's not too far off. In 1 Kings chapter 4, I'd like to just pull a, a brief scripture out here with respect to the time in which Solomon lived and governed Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 4, we'll look, and it says in verse 24, he ruled over all the kingdoms west of the river, from Tifsa to Gaza, and had peace on all sides. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, each man under his own vine and fig tree. This is a picture that Yahweh is painting of the time of Solomon. It, this was actually the zenith of Israel's, Israel's societal strength and stability in this world. 
And we know that immediately after that, when Solomon passed away and Rehoboam took over, Israel split. And from there, Israel had ongoing trouble, Israel and Judah. And in the lifetime of Solomon, you see there was safety all around them. Israel lived in safety, and every man was living under his own vine and fig tree. Now, the reason I wanted to start at this place is because of the terminology that's used here. According to John 15, we know that Yahshua is described as the vine. Yahshua is the vine. And it's from that vine that we receive the fruit of the vine that we will be using to commemorate Yahshua's death, his burial, and his resurrection in just a few short days. We have the example in this passage of every man living under his own vine and fig tree. And the fig tree is described in Mark 13, and maybe we ought to turn to that one in Mark 13, to take a look at what is described with respect to the fig tree. And I believe it's important that we recognize that this description in the time of Solomon is also used in the book of Micah, referencing the last days. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. But first I'd like to go to Mark chapter 13 and take a look at the parable of the fig tree that Yahshua gives us. In Mark 13, we see in verse 28, Yahshua makes this statement. He says, now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's a direct statement by our Savior. Heaven and earth will pass away. The fig tree has a parable for us. This generation will know that what is about to take place is near, right at the very doors. In the time of Solomon, when Israel was at its greatest point of societal strength and stability, Yahweh uses the description of every man living under his vine and fig tree. In the book of Micah, we see the same description once again. If you turn there with me to Micah chapter 4. And we'll see in verse 1, it says, In the last days, the mountain of Yahweh's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. So you may wonder what all this calamity taking place all around us right now is all about in Yahweh's eyes. Ultimately, Yahweh has a plan and a purpose. And as I said last week, it seems to us that the timetable has speeded up and compressed. But actually, that's not the case. From Yahweh's perspective, things are moving along exactly as He has worked His plan out from the onset of creation. And so we should, from that, derive, once again, a sense of security and safety in what's taking place instead of this gnawing, nagging fear that we might have this oversweep us. In the last days, the mountain of Yahweh's temple will be established. This is just a simple prophetic declaration. It's going to happen. Yahweh has spoken it, it will take place. It will be raised above the hills and peoples will stream to it. Look around us at this world right now, we don't see how it's going to happen, but who would have thought that we would be on the brink of economic ruin in the space of three short weeks a month ago? Almost no one. In verse 2 it says, Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house, of the Elohim of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. Don't you look forward to that time? I am. 
I look forward to the time when people are going to come streaming from many nations and say, let's go to the house of the Elohim of Jacob. Let's learn his ways. Let's allow him to teach us so that we can walk that direction. It says the law will go out from Zion, the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree. To me, this is once again a reinforcement of the description we read in the time of Solomon, that there's going to be societal stability and no one will make them afraid. And why will they not be afraid? For Yahweh Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the names of their gods, but we will walk in the name of Yahweh our Elohim forever and ever. So brethren, I just want to make clear to you that the time is coming when we will be sitting under our own vine and our own fig tree. And this is simply another tool in Yahweh's toolbox to get us to what he has described in Micah chapter 4. Yahweh is doing a great work among men. He is bringing people to a realization that there's something more than this world. You know, when you look at what's been taking place around us, you see that there is this fear because people don't know what's coming. For those of us who are Yahweh's people, we do know what's coming if we're reading His Word and applying it to the times we're living in and specifically to ourselves. You see, this descriptive setting that is shown in the time of Solomon in Micah chapter 4 is very clearly something that we need to grasp onto in our lives. There's something that I'd like to talk about today. The title of the message is Pillars of Peace. Pillars of Peace. Yahweh's whole purpose is to have a family. Ultimately, this is what humankind exists for, the development of the family of Yahweh that's going to live with him forever. And we're blessed because we, we actually know his name. We actually have a clue as to what he wants his children to be doing in this world in preparation for the, the world to come. We know the attitudes that he's asking his children to manifest not only within the confines of their family, which is pretty much where it's being shown right now, but also in all our contacts, wherever we relate to other people. So Yahweh is doing all these things for a specific reason. There's nothing accidental in what's taking place. But what I'd like to talk today about is these pillars of peace. To have a prosperous, stable society, there are pillars in which we live today. The first one I'd like to talk about is health. And what I also would hope you do as we go through this message is to see interrelationship between the three. I'm going to have three primary pillars that we're talking about. There will be subsets of some of those pillars as we go along, but there are three primary ones. The first one is health. In Revelation chapter 20, I'm going all the way to the back and then we're going to jump Back to the beginning. But in Revelation 22, in verse 1, it says, Then the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of Yahweh and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit, every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing 
of the nations. Health is a gift of Yahweh. We tend to forget that and take it for granted. We're living in a time right now where health is being removed from a large sector of our society. And because of that, the rest of society has to take corrective action. We have to make adjustments to our life so that we don't become ill. We're not going to go all the way back to Genesis, but we could very easily because of what's described here, the tree of life. We know that that tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. And Yahweh did not allow Adam and Eve to eat from that tree of life after they had taken from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because he said, if they do that now, they'll be just like us. They have to learn from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil first and make a conscious decision which path they're going to follow from the fruit that they have eaten. Now, we've all eaten from that tree. We've all eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All have sinned and fallen short of Yahweh's glory. But ultimately, there will be healing in the leaves of the tree of life in Yahweh's kingdom. And that's something I'm looking forward to. So what we need to take from that is what's taking place right now in the world is a temporary condition. And it's a temporary condition just as our sin is a temporary condition. If we forsake that sin, if we confess that sin, and then take Yahshua's sacrifice and his shed blood upon us for protection. That's what Israel did with that Passover lamb. And the apostles were very clear in their description that Yahshua is our Passover lamb. And so we see that Yahshua the Messiah plays a pivotal role in this whole this whole process that's currently taking place. So we have this health issue that's out there. You need to have healthy people to have a healthy society. That's becoming very clear around us right now. I'd like to go to Exodus 15 as well. And this is a passage I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And if you're not, you are familiar with having heard it quoted. So we'll go there. Exodus 15 and verse 26. Yahweh made a decree and a law for them, and there he tested them. He said, If you listen carefully to the voice of Yahweh your Elohim and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I'll not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am Yahweh Rapha. One of the titles of Almighty Yahweh is Yahweh our healer, Yahweh Rapha. And so we see that even in the midst of all this, if people would turn to Yahweh and the change that could be affected visibly and markedly at this time so that we could get back to quote-unquote normal interaction. We are living through this to teach us a lesson. And not only to teach us a lesson, but to provide an example for others around us. So as I said, that several of these pillars I'm going to talk about have subsets. Health is one such pillar. You have this physical health, which is under attack quite literally by an unseen enemy right now, the unseen enemy of a virus around us. There's also emotional and spiritual health. I'd like to just show you that emotional health is something that has been struggled with throughout time. It's not something that is a new thing. It may have a new title, but it certainly is anything if you look at the scriptures. If you turn back to Psalm chapter 13, if you'll turn there with me, we'll look at the king that preceded Solomon, King David, and we'll look at this psalm. It's not very long, but it surely describes his mental anguish 
that he was going through, the struggle he was enduring. And he says in verse 1, How long, O Yahweh, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? David had a real struggle. He was in anguish as he's coming before Yahweh and asking, Yahweh, what's what's the problem here? How long is this going to continue? And Yahweh, being who Yahweh is, with his wisdom, his compassion, his long-suffering, did not let David suffer beyond what he was able to bear. David says in verse 3, he says, Look on me and answer, O Yahweh, my Elohim. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say, I've overcome him. My foes will rejoice when I fall. David continues, he says, But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh, for he has been good to me. You see, to have a stable, prosperous, peaceful society, you have to have health, both emotional and mental. You have to have physical health. You have to have spiritual health. And while I'm not going to go into it, I'll just recommend you do something that I've started as a pattern from when I first started going to Africa, and that was when I discovered, (laughs) quite accidentally, that the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters, and of those 31 chapters, each one can line up to a day in the month. If you read through the book of Proverbs, you can see the plan Yahweh has for spiritual health and direction. I just want to read the beginning of the book of Proverbs, the first chapter, just the the opening portion for you, so you get a a clue that if you would read a chapter, whatever day of the month it is, for example, this is the fourth day of the month of April, well, read chapter 4, see what it talks about. Tomorrow, read chapter 5, go through the entire book. It'll be a constant reminder on a monthly basis as to what Yah was doing. This is the purpose for the book of Proverbs having been written for us. And these are, once again, getting back to the man who led Israel at the strongest point of its existence, when it was an example to us as to what a true, truly stable and peaceful society should be, what it represents on this earth. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. The purpose of these Proverbs, verse 2, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young, Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Reading this book of Proverbs on a regular basis will enhance your spiritual health. That's what it will do in a decisive and meaningful way as you apply the principles that are contained within it to your daily life. So Solomon was a a critical part of us understanding the times in which we live. The purpose of why we're here is to develop the characteristics that we just read so that we can live them forever. Each one of us needs health individually, but we also need to have health on a societal level. That's something that's been lacking. When you look at the things that have been taking place, some of the direct contradictions 
that are being foisted upon us by people in authority relative to Yahweh's description of strong spiritual health. That's a pillar that we must continue to look at and recognize as necessary and vital for a society to continue to function and to function well. I'd like to just go to Ephesians chapter 6 also. Ephesians chapter 6, and most of us are familiar with this on a slightly different level. At the end of the chapter, verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Master and in His mighty power. This is the purpose of us putting on the armor of Yahweh, to become strong in the Master and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of Yahweh so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Do you think it's any accident that what's taking place right now in the world that's causing all this upheaval is something we can't see? I think Yahweh has very deliberately used something like this and allowed something like this into this world to get us to start thinking, move us toward realizing that He has a purpose and His purpose is eternal, His purpose is perfect, and it is worked among men because of His love for humanity. The second of the pillars to have a strong society is one that is in danger at the present time of being knocked out from under us. And that is economy. Economy is nothing more than an exchange of values. Whether it is that have value that others can use, you can look at computer programs and one person develops it, and then others use it, that has value, so you buy that program. We have other values that take place, exchanging goods in this world. If one person has goods that others desire, for example, an automobile, they exchange it, the one receives a car, the other one receives either something that they barter for or money. It's an economic system. There's nothing wrong with an economic system, but what is wrong is when people become lovers of money. Why is that wrong? Well, if an economic system is based upon and revolves around an exchange of values from one person to another, if you love money, you are coveting values others possess that are not yours. We must be impartial in the use of our money to the greatest extent we possibly can, even though we all have a human nature and we struggle with that. We must do our utmost to make sure that we are being just and fair and righteous in our interactions, in our trade with one another. To go to a passage of the heavenly economic system, and we'll see somebody that was not just and fair and impartial in Yahweh's economic system. And we'll read about the end result. If we go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. And we won't go through the whole passage, although it would surely serve you well if you have the time to do so. And you might this coming week, uh, depending upon how restricted you are where you're living. In Ezekiel 28, it says in verse 15, you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. The spreading the net of trade over everyone with wrong motivation 
created the crisis that took place in the heavens. So I drove you in disgrace from the Mount of Elohim. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. We can go back to the book of Revelation and we can see an even more detailed description of what's going to take place at Satan's conclusion. And this is a passage very clearly about Satan, the one who was perfect. He was the sum of beauty and perfection. And then he began to use Yahweh's economic system and turning it toward himself. And his motivation was pride and corruption and violence. And Yahweh said, enough is enough. You've got to get out of here. You're done. Well, we're living in an economic system which has rejected Yahweh's basic principles for a long, long time. Yahweh's system works among men. If we go back to Leviticus chapter 25, we can see how it all fits together. You see, economies to have a rise and fall, mountains and valleys. Yahweh builds a valley into his economic system every seventh year, just as he gives us a day of rest during the weekly, the weekly cycle. He gives us the seventh day as our day of rest. It's our downtime. Well, now we have an enforced downtime that's taking place. And I believe the length of this virus is going to have a direct correlation with our economic system. Just as the banishment of Israel or of Judah was a direct correlation of Israel in the promised land having not kept Yahweh's economic cycle faithfully. So in Leviticus chapter 25, we'll see a description of what Yahweh has in store for us, what he has in mind that we should be doing, what has not been done economically in our time. It's not even recognized anymore. Everything has been geared, especially in the last 30 to 40 years, to how do we avoid a recession? How do we avoid an economic downturn? Yahweh says, don't avoid them, plan for them. They're going to come periodically. Every seventh year is supposed to be a time of rest. So let's look here in Leviticus chapter 25. Yahweh speaks to Moses on Mount Sinai. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm going to give you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath to Yahweh. For six years, sow your fields. For six years, prune your vineyards and gather their crops. But in the seventh year, the land is to have a Sabbath of rest, a Sabbath to Yahweh. What would our economy look like today? How strong and resilient would it be if we were following strictly six days of work and one day of rest? And then six years of working our land, working our economy, and then having a seventh year of rest, of downtime. Well, right now, pretty much everybody has enforced downtime. Yahweh is still sovereign, and His way is the best. Too many people either reject that or don't think of it. So Yahweh says this, Do not sow your fields or prune your vineyards. Oh, there's the vineyard cup creeping back in. Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your untended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. 
Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you. You can go out and eat those things, but you're not supposed to harvest them. You're not supposed to gather them all together and store them up. Just eat what you necessarily need during that period of time. It says, for yourself, for your manservant, your maidservant, the hired worker, the temporary resident who lives among you, as well as for your livestock and the wild animals in your land. Whatever the land produces may be eaten. So Yahweh makes provision that, yes, you can eat during that Sabbath year what the land produces, but you're not to harvest it. You're not supposed to store it up for future use. Very reminiscent of what took place in the wilderness with the manna during the course of the week and what Yahweh's instructions were there. But it doesn't end there with Yahweh's economic system. It's not just six years work, seventh year rest. That's not the only part. We come to the next part, a part that Yahshua quotes in his ministry relative to himself. It says, count off seven Sabbaths of years. Now, I know enough of us have trouble getting from sunup to bedtime and keeping Yahweh's things in the forefront of our minds and having His Word regulate our thoughts, our motivations, our actions during the course of a day. And what has happened? And I count myself partially responsible for this, and that is, Because of the span of time, six years and then a year of rest, I know I personally in my ministry have not emphasized this nearly enough, the importance of why Yahweh has given this. He has this so we can have our mountains and valleys, the sixth year being a year of double blessing and increase. You look at what's been taking place in our economy in the last three and a half years. We've had unprecedented forward motion and prosperity taking place. Do you realize it's been wiped out in less than a month? The last three and a half years are gone in a month. Where are we going to go from here? Our economic system is stumbling and stumbling badly because of the contraction that's taken place among the workforce. And when we get to the third pillar... I hope you're going to see the seriousness that all this plays. Now, the first pillar is under assault. Our health, our physical health, is under attack at the current time. And as I said, it's an unseen enemy. It's an unseen force. Now, we have, because of that, the next pillar is on the verge of collapse because for a a long, protracted period of time, we have not been following Yahweh's economic principles. Let's continue to read now. It says in verse 8, Count off seven Sabbaths of years, seven times seven years, so that the seven Sabbaths of years amount to a period of 49 years. Then have the trumpet sounded everywhere on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, sound the trumpet throughout your land. Consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants, which is the quotation that is on the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. It shall be a jubilee for you, each one of you, is to return to his family property and each to his own clan. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the untended vines, for it is a jubilee and is to be holy for you. Eat only what is taken directly from the fields. Whatever grows voluntarily, you're allowed to eat that, but that's it during this time, because this is holy to Yahweh. And it says, in this year of Jubilee, everyone is to return to his own property. You see, Yahweh has this all thought out. We're sort of trying to catch up to to realizing what Yahweh has this all planned out for. Yahweh knows exactly why he's done it. It's to sustain 
the vitality of the earth that produces crops. It's to sustain us and restore us a day of rest and worship. Once again, restoring our spiritual health on the Sabbath day, the weekly Sabbath. Restoring and reinvigorating our body with vitality so that we can continue on the next six days. Yahweh's worked this all out, and it's truly a beautiful plan. Put into practice, we would not be in the state we are today. And I'm not even getting into the whole aspect of the clean and unclean foods and how that plays into what we're currently going through, how this all started where it jumped from animal to man. That's why we don't have any resistance to this. That's why they've never seen anything like this before. Because it's a jump and nobody has been prepared for that. You can't prepare for every eventuality. The only preparation we can truly make as disciples of Yahshua and children of Yahweh is to take a stand for truth and to live according to Yahweh's principles as we gain the understanding and the insight into their importance. It says in verse 17, Don't take advantage of each other, but fear your Elohim. I am Yahweh your Elohim. I can tell you this of a certainty, and that is if this coronavirus continues on, if the restrictions that are taking place right now within our society continue unchecked for another several months, we will have an economic collapse. There's no way around it. And I don't know how many of you have thought through what the ramifications of that would be in your life because we just take everything for granted. We are living right now with a normalcy bias. We're expecting our checks to come in. I know there are a lot of businesses that have stretched themselves beyond the max in the hope that the government is going to print more money, which is in it of itself ignorant, but they are hoping that they get free money from the government so that they can continue paying their employees so that when this all passes, they can get back to quote-unquote normal. The problem with that is we're going to have extended ourselves so far beyond the limit of, of recovery that this whole system will come down if it continues on another two to three months. This is going to be a tremendously fearsome time. So we need to understand that Yahweh has worked things out. The only thing that we can do at that point, if we get to total collapse, the only way we can recover an economy is to get back to biblical principles. There's going to have to be forgiveness of debts. We didn't go through the entire chapter, but if you look at the forgiveness of debts that has to take place, returning back to your original possession every 50 years, we're going to have to do a major and complete reset in order that we can move forward again. We won't be able to continue with business as usual because the debt is going to crush not only the generation that's out there today, it's going to crush our children and our grandchildren and probably into the fourth generation. And they won't be able to shoulder the weight of that burden. So this is something we need to understand. Yahweh does have an economic system. There's one in the heavens. Satan distorted and corrupted it. He had to get kicked out as a consequence of it. We have one in this world. It's an economic system that recognized up until probably 75 to 100 years ago that recognized that there were ebbs and flows to the economy, and they sort of planned for it. You can read back through history at the panics that took place and the recessions that took place and the depressions that took place. They sort of planned for it. But this one is totally different because people don't, for the most part, have a biblical foundation and trust and hope in this book. That has to change. And brethren and sisters, I'm here to tell you today that if the economy comes down, we need to all stand united and say with one voice, let's get back to biblical economic principle. That's the only way 
we have any hope of resetting an economy in a meaningful way in our time. So, as I said, because we've gone through this long extended period of no rest for our economy, trying to avoid the rest periods and cycles that Yahweh has built into it, we have ultimately come to a place where Yahweh is going to enforce a rest. And I don't know if this is going to be it. This may just be a, okay, people, wake up. Something real is about to happen. Your salvation is nearer than when you first believed. I don't know if it's one of those moments or if it's actually going to take things down. The virus is setting the timetable at this point, and we need to understand that. And ultimately, it's Yahweh that directs that virus, what it can and cannot do. So we have an economic system is not a bad thing. Love of it is truly bad. Misuse of that system is truly bad. When you look at Judas at the Passover, he misused that system. He took those 30 pieces of silver that could have been used to benefit others. And he took it as a blood price for our Savior. So we need to understand all this stuff works together. The time in which we're living, the time of year, the springtime, should be a time when we're focusing our thoughts upon how can we get closer to Yahweh? How can we do things more His way than our own? I'd like to go to Amos Chapter 8, Amos chapter 8, just as a reminder. Verse 11. Yahweh has used famine throughout history to get people's attention. And if you remember the example I used last week of uh, Jacob and his family, they took their bags of silver and their gold down into Egypt to purchase food to survive. The famine that's spoken of here in Amos chapter 8 is another famine. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Yahweh, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food, or a thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of Yahweh. There is a time coming when the message will be over. There will be a famine. It says men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of Yahweh, but they will not find it. We should count ourselves so blessed to have the word of Yahweh and to have it within us, guiding us and leading us in our daily lives. You know, I mentioned about Satan in Ezekiel 28, and that's a sobering reminder that the economy is intended to be an exchange of values. Each person has value whether you acknowledge that or not. Every person is important. Yahweh's desire is that all mankind be saved because we all do have value. We are all given His Spirit. We all have that Spirit within us, whether we corrupt it or whether we nurture it and make it completely like Him and and harmonize with Him. We all have His Spirit within us. And so it's important that we try to do things Yahweh's way. Which leads us now to the third pillar. And the third pillar that I want to talk about is one that's unique to the time in which we live. It has never been developed as totally and in such a complex manner as it is today throughout the history of mankind. The third pillar I want to talk about has to do with technology. Technology. Because we have today a society that worships 
at the altar of technology. Now, don't get me wrong. Technology is not completely bad. If it wasn't for technology, you wouldn't be listening to this message right now. It can be used in a good and meaningful way, a way that builds people up and strengthens them and strengthens society. But it has this huge negative undertow of evil that is focused upon the use of technology. What's going to happen? And this is where I want you to start thinking a little more seriously about where we are. We see how one of the two legs of health is jeopardizing the second entire leg. And if it is not dealt with or resolved, it's going to bring that leg down. There's no question about it. I heard somebody this past week make the analogy. They said with the government forcing the shutdown of the economy, which is what's taking place right now, when governors are closing doors, it's for the health of the people, admittedly so. But they are also simultaneously cutting off the economy. They're shutting it completely, almost completely. When that takes place, this person made the analogy of you're flying at 40,000 feet in a 747 that's loaded. And you cut all the engines off. Just turn them off. And let that plane start coming down to earth. And right before it crashes, you expect that you're going to turn those engines back on and regain altitude. That's what the economists are hoping to do with this forced recession that we're currently in. It's never been done before. It's never even been tried before because it's so foolhardy. But people, in the pride of their intellect, believe that they are now beyond any rules. They can make the rules. And so now we have this third pillar that comes along, and that's technology. What takes place if the economy tanks? Stop and think for a moment. We're enjoying the benefits of technology right now. Most of you are sitting in your homes. I'm sure you have electricity. You have heat. You have all the necessities. You have food that you can order online and have it shipped to you, or you can go pick it up in your car without getting out of your car and drive back home with it. We have all this technology that's out there, and there's a lot of it that can be used in a good way. But what happens when the economy tanks? And people no longer have the money to pay their employees. How many employees are going to voluntarily just keep going to work for nothing? That impacts your groceries. That impacts your electricity. How many people are going to be operating electric plants? It impacts the energy supply you have. How many people are going to continue going to work and working for nothing? for free. It's not going to happen. You need to have these things working together as they have been more or less for a society to function. What happens after that? I'm not trying to draw some kind of doomsday picture that's going to have everybody screaming and running for the hills. That's not who I am. But we need to understand that without Yahweh's blessing, without his working among men, this whole thing is going to collapse and will become part of the dustbin of history. I mean, you stop and think of how many technologies, something as simple as the building of the pyramid, something as, I shouldn't say simple because it was pretty complex, something as basic as the building of the pyramids in Egypt. We still haven't figured out how that was done. They had a technology we don't have access to now. Our minds don't think in those terms. This whole technology, this whole system that we're under right now can collapse completely. And man's thoughts will go a different direction. You see, we don't know. We don't think in those terms. We're used to all the comforts we have. We demand them. We're entitled, we say. No, we're not entitled to anything. We should be grateful for the blessings that Yahweh has given us. 
So what, what do we see here? My idea of technology is that this is our modern day Tower of Babel. What do I mean by that? Well, people use technology on all levels, on all fronts, not just for good, but for self-promotion, self-exaltation, for opposition to Yahweh, if you will. You go on the internet, it doesn't take you an awful lot of time to start finding people that are profanely trying to destroy truth and just blatant disrespect for Almighty Yahweh. I want to go to Genesis 11. Like I said, my perception of te technology is it's our Tower of Babel. Who knows how that was presented to the people as they were building that tower. Let's go back and take a look at this. It's an interesting section of Scripture. And it's not just that it's in Genesis 11, but you go back to Revelation and the whole kingdom that sprang from the attitude that created the Tower of Babel is going to continue through society until Yahshua's return. Babylon the Great, the worst one that's ever been, is going to be in immediately preceding Yahshua's return. And so we need to prepare for this reality. This is not something that's being hallucinated up. These aren't dislocated, disjointed ideas that are just being thrown out there. I'm trying to show you a picture that Yah was trying to wake not just his people up, not only to get us to awaken from our slumber, but everybody on the face of this earth to realize there's something out there, that there is a power superior to who we are. In Genesis 11, it says in verse 1, Now the whole world was one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks. Let's bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And of course, I'm not a construction engineer, but I can tell you, go talk to one. Go find one and talk to them. See which is the better alternative for constructing something that lasts. Then they said, come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. They were intent on making a name for themselves, building themselves a city. It was all about me, me, me. That's the foundation of Babel. And that's what I see as the foundation of our technology today. It's all about self-serving, self-worship, easing anything that may be the least bit uncomfortable in our lives. And so we sit, at, sit around and not accomplish the work of Almighty Yahweh. And it is work. It is work to do His will. You know, you see this Babylon rearing its head in the format we just read in Gen Genesis chapter 11. And then we go on. And we see in Daniel chapter 4, the king of Babylon. I'd just like to pull out one of his dreams. One of his dreams that it took a servant, a child of Yahweh, to interpret and give the sense to. If you go to Daniel chapter 4, Daniel chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar was a living manifestation of the attitude of the kingdom he led. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar writes to the peoples, nations, and men of every language who live in all the world. Isn't that kind of interesting? To every language that lives in all the world. He is the head of the kingdom that originated with the tower that caused the division of the languages. 
May you prosper greatly, he says. It's my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High El has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in my bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, the enchanters, the astrologers and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they couldn't interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He's called Belteshazzar. This is a parenthetical insertion. After the name of my God and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I said, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know the spirit of the holy mighty one is in you. No mystery is too difficult for you. Here's my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in my bed. I looked and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like our government today, doesn't it? Providing food for everybody. They're going to do this. Well, we'll see how this turns out for them. Under it, the beasts of the field found shelter, and the birds of the air lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in my bed, I looked, and there before me was a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, Cut down the tree, trim off its branches, strip off its leaves, and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. It says in verse 17, The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict, so that the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. This is the dream I had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, because none of the wise men of my kingdom can interpret it. And so Daniel interprets the dream. But it says in the interim, after he was commissioned by Nebuchadnezzar to interpret the dream, he was greatly perplexed. And his thoughts terrified him. And the king told him, he reminded him, he said, Belteshazzar, don't let the dream or its meaning alarm you. And so Daniel answered, he said, my sovereign, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries, the tree you saw which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, visible to the whole earth with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit providing food for all, giving shelter, to the beasts of the field and having nesting places in its branches for the birds of the air. He says, you, O king, are that tree. You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky. Your dominion extends to the distant parts of the earth. You, O king, saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it. This is the interpretation, O king. This is verse 24. This is the decree the Most High has issued against my sovereign, the king. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like cattle and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. Look at the purpose of this whole example. Seven times 
will pass by for you seven years until you acknowledge that the Most High, that Yahweh Almighty is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone He wishes. Brethren and sisters, I hope you remember this verse in the next few years. It is Yahweh who is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. I know there are a lot of brethren that like to hate on government authorities. They like to just spew all kinds of vile hatred toward them. Brethren, it is Yahweh that places them there. And we need to accept that truth. He gives them to whoever He wishes. Yahweh wants to give it to someone, they'll receive it. And it's all for part of His purpose to the same effect that we are having right now in this world around us with the calamities we're experiencing. The command to leave the stump of the tree and its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Are we in a time, I'm not, I'm not saying dogmatically that we are, but I will say this dogmatically and unequivocally, and that is, while this may not be the time to acknowledge that the entire world acknowledges that heaven rules, this is definitely something that is leading us to the point where the whole earth, as the scripture says, Every eye is going to see Yahshua and every tongue will confess that Yahweh is sovereign. That time is coming. Because the scripture says it, I believe it. I would rather be thought a fool because of my trust in Yahweh's word than to put my trust in mankind and be proven a fool. People can think whatever they want, but brethren and sisters... Believe in the word of Yahweh. This book is true. This does give us sustainable guidelines by which we can live and prepare for the eternal reality that's coming. Yahweh's kingdom is nearer than when we first believed. Yahshua's return is not that far off. And we need to understand that as things occur around us, that we see them in the scriptures that we see that Yahweh is working a work for His benefit. We are simply instruments in His hand. Let's continue to be used accordingly to glorify Him. Just as a reminder of the certainty of Yahweh's care and His protection of His people, I'd like to go to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation 7. In verse 1, it says after this, and you can go back and read chapter 6, it's a tremendous chapter as well, and it leads right into chapter 7. But we're going to start here in the first verse of chapter 7 in Revelation. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. This is the authority that Yahweh has over His creation, including the angels. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living Elohim. And he called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our Elohim. And then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. And so, the, the damage, the harm, will not come until the proper time. As it says a little bit further down here in the chapter, In verse 10, they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our Elohim who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped Elohim, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our Elohim forever and ever. Amen. And so, what I want to leave you with today is this. You have these pillars of peace. We're seeing them shaken in our time today. Starting from a totally unexpected place. You know, it was less than three months ago that the man who is now the expert advisor to the president was saying that this is something that's insignificant. This is going to be something small and not really important to us, but we just need to keep an eye on it to the point where now today he's foretelling that there could be upwards of a quarter of a million Americans dead from this virus. We don't know what the results are going to ultimately be. We can't put our faith in men because had we put our faith in his descriptions back then, where would we be now? We would have just ignored the whole thing. I am thankful that our president, against the the headwinds of everybody in Congress, around the world, everyone was making a mockery of him, claiming he was racist by closing all flights off from China. Had he not done that, do you know where we would be today? We would be in worse shape than Spain and Italy currently are. They were, cl- they were slow in closing their borders, and look what it gave them. We have to understand that Yahweh is doing a work. He is touching the hearts of men on all levels. And we should be grateful to our Father in heaven for all he has done. We have this virus is taking place right now. We have the Passover. It's going to be on charted territory for us again because we've never done something like that online, especially with an empty room here. We're going to have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And I hope that you'll avail yourself of the added time you have this year to spend that time in introspection, that you'll look at the word of Almighty Yahweh, that you'll apply it to yourself, and that you'll realize society is built one stone at a time, just as the temple of Yahweh is build, built with living stones. We need to let this temple of Yahweh be built in our time. We need to see that the society around us needs the influence of Yahweh's word once again, the restoration of respect and reverence for our Father in heaven. We can be an integral part of that just by the lives we live, by our conversation with others that we come in contact with. We can appreciate something like technology at this time and maximize the good aspects of it for Yahweh's honor and glory because it's not forever, it's temporary, but we can use it at this time to further the kingdom. So my Prayer is that Yahweh would bless each one of you, that his word will go forward in this time because the time is coming when there will be a famine of the word in this world. And it is a blessing that I hope each one of you treasures that we have the, the blessing of Yahweh's word within us, guiding us, sustaining us. It's a truly a, a unique gift and we need to be able to share that with others for the honor and glory of our Heavenly Father. So, may Yahweh bless you. We look forward to having you on the live feed on Tuesday evening. Like I said, we'll probably fire it up a little bit after 7.30 and then get started in earnest around 7.45. And we look forward to having you there. Let's all conclude with a prayer and then we will depart and go our several ways. May you have a restful Sabbath and may your thoughts be fixed upon the blessing of eternity in the heavens that Yahweh has given us. Let's all bow our heads. Almighty Heavenly Father Yahweh, we ask that you would guide us through this period, that you would give us the strength and the foresight 
to recognize the signs of the times in which we live. We pray that we can take lessons that are going to enhance our spiritual growth and development. And not only ours, Father, we, we know we need to be strong for you, but also that we can share those touch points with other people around us so that they will become strengthened in you, that they will begin to trust and believe in the promises that you have placed in your word. To me, it's just so amazing to see how you've written about these things, that you inspired people to put these things down on parchment so many years ago so that we can have this wellspring of faith and trust completely in you as we read them and see them coming to pass before our very eyes. Father Yahweh, strengthen us. May your will be done on this earth as it is in heavens, in the heavens. And Father, we thank you most of all at this time for your Son and our Savior, the example he set, the words he gave us through his teaching as it was directly from you. Father, we need these things at this time to sustain us and guide us. And we just thank you for your blessings in Yahshua's name and thanking you for this time of year. Father, we just ask that you would continue to guide us and open our eyes of understanding. In Yahshua's name we pray. Hallelujah.